I'd like to introduce Sabine Gabaron. Uh, she's uh, an instructor in the French department and has been teaching this comics class now uh, twice. And she's here to share her experiences developing the course, um, implementing the course, and also student feedback. Um, we also have David Superman Carter from the, it's really his unique name, <laughs> from the U of M Library, uh, who is a comic specialist, and he will show you the resources that he's been collecting um, so you know where on campus uh, you can get some help. And we will also send out, the LRC has been starting a collection of foreign language links for you as well, so you don't have to start from scratch in looking for resources. Sabine will share her presentation um, after the event, and we'll link that and send that out to you as well. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about comics and what I did in my two classes. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about my background. Um, of course, you can all recognize me here on the picture. That was me when I was younger. Um, so uh, my background is um, in literature. I, I majored in literature and American literature, and I also majored in second language acquisition. And so for me, um, the text and reading is really important in a language learning, and I feel that it, um, it's really important for students to read. And I'm very much about words, um, about um, reading and text. Um, so I was asked to, um, to create a course because they wanted to, ha um, to have another, an additional course at the 200 le 270 level. So, I was asked to create a course, and um, in a couple of days, I had to come up with um, a topic. And so I sort of started looking around um, in my house and looking for books and interesting ideas. And all of a sudden, I realized I had all these picture books that I was not really interested in, but I knew that I had a lot of them. And they sort of looked like this. And, um, and I had plenty of them at home, and I really had no interest in reading them because I didn't understand how to read them. My husband always made fun of me, but I really didn't understand how to read them. And to me, um, it was a little bit overwhelming visually, and I, I really didn't enjoy reading comics um, before I actually started this course. Um, and then I realized also that my kids were reading these books. And um, all of these were in French, and my kids started reading them. They were three, four, five, so they were not actually reading they were using the pictures to try to understand the story. And so I thought, well, that might be interesting for my students. <laughs> because then if my kids can understand the story and they don't have all that language, then maybe my students will. And um, so thinking about all of this, um, and I also had a background in cinema when I studied literature. Um, I took a, a course on cinema. So I had some ideas of visually how to work with these. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try and create a course based on those. And as you can see, um, so French comics have a really wide variety. Um, so this is about the war, for example. Um, this is with more animals. This is about the Civil War in the US. Um, I'll show you all these books and you could look at them. This is more about politics, about Nicolas Sarkozy, our former president. Um, this is about Versailles and about um, uh, the king. So there was really a lot of variety um, uh, and I thought that I could do something interesting. And then I started thinking about the title of this course. And then I thought, well, how am I going to, what am I going to use? Because to me, <coughs> comics, what was a comic book to me? To me, a comic book was more like this. This was a comic book. Superhero, or maybe this. This was the format. And so then I asked myself, well, what am I going to call this course? Because these are not comics. These are called bande dessinée, which you actually, actually can't really translate. And then I did some research, and that's where I found that there were many, many, many types of comic books. And you have the mangas, and you have the European comic books, and you have the American comic books, and you have the graphic novels, and a whole bunch of different categories. And so then I thought, well, this is really going to be interesting. And I was intrigued. So I did a lot of research, and I learned a lot, and I found that there's, I found way more um, than what I was expecting. And so, um, so that's how it all started. Um, 
And then I also thought that even though I was not really uh, drawn to the images, then with this era right now of our students who are always on their iPad and always bombarded by all these images, I don't think, I thought they would not be overwhelmed with, um, with the format. Um, so, so then I found this interesting book that I used, which is called, um, let me switch here. which means learning and understanding la bande dessinée. Um, and in this book, I found a lot of interesting, um, so it's a comic book about comics, which was really interesting and very useful for students. And so they talk about um, different points of views and what you do with your image and what it means and, and, um, and the point of the author, I mean the, the illustrator, why do they do it this way? They talk about different effects here based on the choices that um, the artists do. And then they talk about movement and, um, and then they talk about um, emotions here. And then when I came to this page, I realized that there was a lot of international coding, that students would be able to understand a lot of things even if they did not understand the language. And that was really interesting to me. Um, and then, of course, the choice of lettering and how much text you're going to put in, uh, what is the effect that you want to create. So I used all of this in my class as a, a, a preparation and uh, to introduce students to the idea of what is a comic and, um, and how they're made. But we never really talked about making comics. We, uh, it was really focused on reading comics. Um, so, so then, um, oops, that's not what I want. I want this one. <clears throat> so then I thought, well, this will be engaging for students. It'll be motivating. Um, it'll be interesting and intriguing because I was interested and intrigued and I had a lot of questions. And then I thought that I could make this personal um, because really you have a personal relationship with what you're reading. Um, so let's look at all these things a little um, in depth and see what I mean by all these things. So why is it engaging? So it's visual. Um, if it's visual, it's going to be stimulating. It's varied in form, as you can see, there are different types of comic books, varied in genres, there's many, many, many different types of genres, so you're going to have different styles based on the authors and the artists. You're going to have different art, different content, uh, content and so it's going to provoke reactions from students. Um, why is it going to be motivating? So there is less text than you can find in a novel or in a you know, regularly formatted texts, there is a lot less text. You have those international codes that I've talked about, um, and then it's familiar. Images are familiar to uh, students. They will be able to understand what they see. Um, so it's going to lower their anxiety level. Um, and so what we did, we, we started with this one, Asterix et Obelix, um, and so a lot of students actually we're familiar with the characters. Um, they had heard of them. Um, and so this is a very, very straightforward, very um, old fashioned comic book. Um, and so we, we started reading that book. Every single student in the class was able to understand the story. Every single student in the class. And so this was at the 232 level. They just mm -hmm. came from 231. We started this right at the beginning of 232. Um, and so what I had expected actually happened. They were all able to understand the text. And then, so this allowed for, um, for of course, as I said, lowering the anxiety level. And um, it also allowed for, um, for them to build confidence and um, it, it created a sort of a comfort level in the class where they all felt that this was possible for them. Um, and so after we did that first step, then we went more in depth into the story. And I don't know if you know about Asterix et Obelix, but there really are different levels of understanding. And even as an adult, if you have read this, these series maybe 10 times, the 11th time, you will find something new about it. It's very, very rich. There's Latin quotes, there's lots of cultural references. Um, so the first time you read through it, you miss a lot of it. 
And so then this enabled me to work at different levels with different students. And some of my students understand maybe 80% of the text. Some of my students only understood 20% of the text, but that didn't matter. So it allowed for different types of level of proficiency in the class, and everybody felt good about it. No one felt that they did not understand the story. So I thought that was really um, interesting for the students. Um, so, so that is when I'm saying different levels of understanding. That's what I mean by that. Um, and then there's imagination that has a big part into this um, because the artists and, uh, and the writers cannot explicitly put everything that they want in their comic book. They have to skip some, some stages. They have to skip some steps. And it's up to the reader to imagine the correlation between two um, images. And so um, that was also very motivating for the students because they could um, interpret the text and they could um, have their own view on what was going on. Um, so interesting and intriguing. Um, so there are different types of stories. There are different types of comics. So that's going to be interesting. What's going to be intriguing will be the choice of the authors. Why do they choose to do this that way? Um, and so they're going to ask themselves questions. Um, why did the artist choose to do that way? Who had a say over what? Was the image more important than the text? And what is the effect? Um, and so the whole process behind the scenes became really interesting and it was thought-provoking. They really asked themselves questions. Um, and then finally, the personal uh, aspect of it. So as I said, there's some interpretation going on and then they create a special relationship um, between the characters um, and, uh, and then they could choose the genres that they like and the type of book and the type of media. We read books we read books and then we also read them online. We used a lot of online reading. And so then afterwards they could sort of choose what they preferred and what they liked and what worked better for them. Um, so, how do I, here, what do I need? Oh, there it is. So what was the purpose of the class? So the purpose um, of the class was of course to, um, for them to improve their language as a whole, the speaking, the writing, the listening, the reading, we did all of that. Um, we did vocabulary, we did grammar, everything was in integrated into the course. Um, and have a better understanding of French culture. All of these carry a lot of culture. And because the text is limited, there, the text is very, very rich. And there are a lot of um, um, cultural connotations. And they really choose their word very carefully. So that's where uh, the text becomes very, very rich. And it's actually very dense, even though it's not a lot in quantity there is a lot to say about a couple of words. Um, so a lot of culture into these books. Um, become more comfortable in a foreign language setting, so being able to, uh, to speak, to express your opinions, and to share meaningful information. So we did all of this um, by reading and analyzing what I call French comics, which are really bande dessinée. Um, so we didn't create any of any comics, we just read them and we um, analyzed them. Um, so we did all of these through a lot of research and a lot of reading. Um, so what type of books did we look at? So we looked at um, books about comics and I found that there are a lot of books about comics in French and in English, so I'm sure that you would find a lot for uh, your language. Um, and then there are, we use the dictionary. This is um, the Dictionnaire Mondial de la Bande Dessinée, um, where you have the whole history of Bande Dessinée. And so we used, um, I used a lot of this. And um, so this is written in French. So we used some of these um, to, to read some things about um, the history of la Bande Dessinée or about techniques and um, all these things. And then we read comic books. So everyone read um, Asterix et Obelix, which was the first one. And then everyone read another that I will talk about at the end. So we ordered these from France. Unfortunately, if you're going to 
look into Spanish comic books, Italian comic books, you're not going to find them here. Um, there is one store in Ann Arbor, um, Vault of Midnight. It's an awesome store, but unfortunately they don't really have the books in the target language. So we had to order them online. They were a little bit pricey, but that was the only thing students had to buy. And then um, we used a lot of online resources. So the online resources um, were, I found an incredible amount of resources in French and in English. Um, there are many, many, many things to, um, to look at. I'm going to show you some of them. And then, of course, we used some of the online um, comic books, and these you can really find in any language. Um, and there are a lot out there, really a lot out there. So if you cannot find the actual books, you can find them online. So I'm going to show you here um, a few So if I click, it should go directly yeah. Um, so this is an example here of I'm going to show you examples of uh, sites that we looked at um, where they could find information. So this is um, uh, one of the most famous French festivals um, about la bande dessinée. And so they look through, and every year there's a selection, and then um, the students actually, uh, in, when I taught it in 274, it was in the winter, and this happens in the winter, and the students looked at all the selection, and they read some part of the, the, uh, the books, and they actually voted. And then during the semester, we saw the selection, and then we compared to what they had liked uh, compared to what the French had liked and what they had liked and who had been selected and who had won the, the best award. So this was really engaging and uh, very interesting to them. Um, so that's one example. Um, so that's another one that we explored. Um, so as I said, there are um, now a lot of online um, comic books. And so this is a festival, but it's a festival about blogs. So you have all these bloggers who um, get together in Paris, and, um, and so they have every single year um, all these artists who come and who sign things and who talk with their uh, readers. And so we looked at, um, so why, oh, there it is. And so these are all the bloggers. And so this is really something interesting because students can follow them and they can um, choose according to what type of artist they like. And, um, and, and so this is updated all the time and they post things every day. Um, so this is really interesting um, to students. So this is also something that we explored and uh, that I found really interesting. Um, this is a series. And so the authors um, created this series and they asked for their readers' feedback. And every week they post what follows and they ask, how would you want the story to change? And so the students can have an input on the story and they use everybody's input to sort of create um, what is going to follow. So this is also another way to engage students um, and to, to make them interested. Um, so that's a first in France. They're trying to do this, and it works really well. Um, and then I'm just going to show you here. This is a little iffy. Um, I'm going to show you here. So this is the online, um, what I used to look at the online uh, comic books. And so you can order them for 10 days, and you pay between one and three euros, so this is really not expensive. Or you can buy them for six euros, and that means that you keep them on your computer, just as you would buy a book. Um, and so students um, can pick and choose whatever they like, and some of them were assigned, and uh, uh, every week you have the new ones that are uh, coming out, and they do a little um, um, trailer of the ones that are coming out. Um, see, these are two euros to buy, um, um, so these are really not expensive. I'm, why is it not showing the whole page? Oh well. Um, so you can choose um, your language, you can choose the genre, and then some of them are free. And a lot of them actually are free, and so with the students we, we read a lot of them that, um, that were free on there. Um, 
so that's just an example of things that you can explore um, in the classroom. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about activities that I did in class and that I thought that worked really well. So I'm going to start with um, this idea of sharing and then information gathering and then what I call collaborative reading. So sharing, um, this is something that you probably do in your classroom um, anyway, but I think it's important to, uh, to talk about that because really students enjoy it. Um, so the students presented a comic of their choice um, and so that was personalized and individual. I had no say over what they chose. They just brought um, the comic to class and, um, and they talked about the text and the art. And so the goal was for them to uh, be convincing and to make the others want to read what they liked. Um, so they had to be convincing in the way that they presented. And then some of them compared to the types of bande dessinée that we had talked about or the different types of comics or mangas. Um, that we talked about in class. So this made the students responsible for the content. Um, and so they were more engaged and um, they were more interested in the content because they were part of the choice. They also did another presentation and there they cho cho uh, chose the content. So it was a um, PowerPoint presentation that they did with a partner. Um, and they could talk about anything. So they could talk about an author, a cultural theme. Um, so some of them chose to talk about the representation of homosexuality in comics. Uh, some of them talked about um, the choice of uh, clothing in a certain type of manga. Um, some of them talked about um, censorship. Um, and so the students uh, the other students were taking notes and then they had to write a report and they had to pick at least three or four um, presentations that they liked and what they had learned about, uh, about that was interesting, what they had learned in the presentations. So once again, it's the same thing. It makes students responsible for the content of the course and then they're more engaged. And so, as I said, this you probably already do some type of thing like that in your class, but I really want to emphasize this because students really enjoyed learning from these presentations and they uh, repeatedly said in the evaluations that um, that was one of their favorite part of the class. Um, so that's the sharing. Now, what do I call, when I talk about information gathering, um, so this is mostly on the internet, information on the internet that students will gather. Um, so they choose what they're interested in. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of uh, activities. And then they come to class with what they have found. Um, they have activities and questions to answer. There's always a task, always something to do. Um, and then they bring in their computers and then they're going to share in class um, with the others in the group. And so um, I always create a follow-up activity in the group and they draw conclusions from their group work. So it's a, a, a group activity and everybody comes from their own findings. I'm going to show you some examples here. So I think all of these are loaded. Okay, so this is a website. Um, so this is something that we did really early on and it, it's just about covers, comic covers. And so when you look, you know, you can already see that, well, there's probably going to be a, a wide variety of choice. Um, and so I'm going to show you an example. So then they choose, this is an editor. Um, and so there's a list of a lot of um, possibilities and they choose something that they like and then they can g look through them and look at the, um, at the covers and what do they find interesting? Um, so they have questions to answer. Um, and so once again, this is personal and this is based on their um, likes and dislikes. And sometimes they find things and they really don't like, and then they can also share that. And they can say, oh, I really didn't like that type of comic. So it's not just about what they like, but uh, it can be um, about something that they do not like. Um, and so it's impossible for me to bring all of that content to class. Um, I, can, I cannot, I'll show you another example. Um, so see the list here is just endless. Um, there's no way for me to give examples of everything. Um, another site here that I used was this one. 
which talks about the, uh, the masters of the European uh, bande dessinée. And so again, there's lots of choices here. And if you click, um, then you can see one type of art. Um, and then if you go deeper into there, then you can read actually a piece of it. And then they have information on the authors. Um, so once again, they pick and choose and they browse through uh, the website and then they bring the information to class. Um, another one here that is also very rich, um, which shows all the different types of bande dessinée. So you, the students can choose here, so this is by genre. And um, you have a whole bunch of genres, so according to what you like, if you like fantasy, um, if you like uh, thrillers, then you can see the examples. Um, and for example, um, so what did I click here? Uh, and then this is the list, endless list of all these pages, of all the examples. Um, so students look at these and browse through these and then the, uh, so that's why they come to class with their computers because then they can show. Um, it's not just talking about what you have found, it's actually showing what you have found. One of them found this one I really like, iPhone, made it French, um, and so it's a story about iPhones in French. Um, and so, so they bring their computers to class and then they show each other what they have found and what they like and what they find interesting. Um, and then they try to draw some conclusions on the style and the types of, um, of authors, um, the types of um, text that they can find, etc. cetera. Um, and that's another one here, the last one that I wanted to show you. And so that's also another example of um, these are um, festivals, a lot of festivals. And so if you look at the list, it's the same thing. Many, many, many different festivals. So they choose the festivals that seems interesting, and then they come to class, and then um, they share, and they bring what they have found to class, and they learn from each other. Um, this is one, for example, that seems interesting. Um, and so what's in there's another one here that is going to happen in um, very soon here. And so it's updated. Um, and so it's very, um, it's current. It's updated and then students can find every single semester, they will find different type of information because the festivals are going to be different, the places are going to, to be different. Um, so that's what's nice about it is that there is a lot of content and the content changes all the time. Uh, so that's what makes it interesting also for the instructor. Um, so this information gathering, what does it do? So it's another way of bringing the content to the course that I could not bring if, uh, if it was just me. Um, it makes students responsible for the content and for their learning. And it gives them choice and the idea of ownership. Um, and that's really important because they feel that they own um, their mm -hmm. learning. Um, and so, again, the idea of personalization, um, each group comes up with different um, conclusions. They all have a different experience. They all look at different content, and that's okay. Um, and that's what they actually like about this. Um, and so the last thing that I'm going to talk about is collaborative reading. And um, so that's what I tried for the first time last semester in um, 232. So what I did is that I separated the class into three groups. Um, I used this bande dessinée here, um, which is called um, Résistance. So it's about, it's a story about three characters during um, the Second World War. And each volume um, is in sequence. So if you read volume number one, you have the beginning of the story. Volume number two, the middle. Re number three, you have the end. And so I separated the class into three groups. And each group read one of them. So they only had part of the story. And um, so then they had to share with others in order to find the missing pieces of the story. And they were put in groups of threes one person from each book, and then they started trying to figure out what had happened and what was the story. Um, so they need to understand their own story first in order to be able to share. 
Um, so it motivates them to learn, motivates them to understand. Um, and they're responsible for the content. If you're in a group of three and you have to talk about your book and no one read your book, you have to be able to, um, to know what's going to happen in your book. And then there's a desire to get the information, not necessarily to give the information. Maybe they're not really enthusiastic in giving and sharing, but they want to get the information from the others because they want to know what happens and what happened to this character and why did they do this. Um, so again, it's going to motivate them to exchange the information. They're going to be really motivated and they're responsible for effective communication. Remember, all of this happens in the, in the foreign language. They're doing all of this in French and there are 232 students. Um, so they have to negotiate the meaning. And um, I was really impressed with what I saw in the classroom when this happened. Um, because they were really able, they, they had created an attachment to these characters and they really wanted to share um, the story and they really wanted to learn more from each other. Um, so, so they were relying on each other um, to understand the story. They were relying on the other students in their group. And, um, and so they, some of them were really, they got really emotionally attached to certain characters. And so they really wanted to know, and so, so who was the baby and who killed? Oh no, I can't believe this, he did this, no, no, prove it, show me. And so they were showing in the book and saying, it happened right there, no, let me see. What does it say? No, it doesn't say. And they were doing all of that in French. It was just amazing. I was just looking at all these students and I was amazed, every single student was really into it and so they were looking at dates and saying no but this happened before and uh, they were looking at all the clues and all the visual clues also and what was really interesting about this series is that in each book there is a flash forward and a flashback so everybody sort of had little pieces of everything and everybody was working together to try to find out um, what the real story was and it was even more interesting because there's a fourth book to the series that is yet to be published. So a lot of questions remain unanswered. They're like, oh no, I can't believe we're not gonna know what really happened. And so this was really fun because then I had them um, try to imagine. So what do you think is going to happen? What would you do if you were the author? How would you make this story end? So then it really became very creative and they were able to um, make some hypotheses and try to think, oh, I want her to do this, or no, I want him, or he's the bad guy, he's the good guy. Um, so this was very, very fun. Um, and so all of that was done in French, of course. So there's an interpretation of the story using the text and the art for clues. Um, then they're making a puzzle, so they're working together as a group, and there's the emotional aspect. And so if you're connected emotionally, then of course you're going to learn better and remember better. So what did we do at the end of the semester? There was an end of semester project where they chose their um, bande dessinée and they analyzed it, so every single student had a different one. Um, and then they showcased their work and engaged um, conversation about comics with other people than their classmates. Um, we did this in North Quad and we invited people from outside and so they were really, um, so it was personalized because they each had individual things. It was meaningful to them. They were very proud and very motivated to share what they had learned and what they um, had found out about comics. Um, and it was interesting for me, of course, um, when I read their final analysis, um, they made me read some things that I would have never read, I think. But it was interesting because, you know, I discovered some things. Um, so it was really interesting for me. Um, two weeks ago, I told my students I'm going to talk about this and I'm going to try to, um, to show the value of teaching with comics. If you have any um, comments on uh, what you liked about the class, just send me an email. So they sent me an email and I got a ton of email and I was really happy to get all these quotes and um, you can read them later, but I wanna show you the words that were really important here to me. So this is from 232. So it improved my comprehension of the language. Um, 
I felt inspired and motivated because it was creative and personalized. Um, and then here it says it was a great medium for French culture in addition to the language because of the subtlety and the cultural references in the work. Um, here they said it was a complete immersion into French culture and it was engaging. Um, here they used again interesting, engaged, fun, thought-provoking, um, empowered. So that student talked about the activity uh, that I just mentioned and he says uh, it was amazingly effective and I've never felt more empowered in my French studies than I did when my group and I effectively pieced together the series. We didn't know how to say everything we wanted to in French, but we used what we did know to get our points across. Um, and so this encouraged me to work through barriers in the language. Uh, so this is really what I wanted to get to, and, um, and I'm really happy that that student felt that way. Um, and then here they talk about um, efficient style of learning, so that was 232. Then the 274 talked about choice. Um, they talked about encouraging to explore our interests, so again, personal connections to the French culture. Um, less intimidating to speak, so that student um, compared this to a literature class where he said that when it's too scholarly, then maybe students feel a little bit dumb and they maybe don't want to share, whereas in this class everybody was speaking and everybody was sharing. This student is currently in France. And so she said it gave her um, some tools to actually understand her French professors who talk about Asterix and Obelix all the time. So she knows what they're referring to. Um, this one says that um, it helped them adapt their language based on the audience. Um, and then finally, this one said that it expanded her vocabulary. And I feel this is interesting because, as I said, the text is limited, but still she felt it expanded her vocabulary. Um, and gave her a way to an analyze more in depth the language. So I hope that um, this you know, inspired you to try to use comics. Um, I feel that students um, really gain a lot from it and as I said, it really lowers the anxiety level in the classroom. Everybody feels that they can do something with it. It empowers them and, um, and that's it. And I, that's all I wanted to say, so thank you for coming. So Before we jump into questions, David, do you want to show your sure. resources? We have them loaded here. You've done an awful lot of work for us already. Yeah, Hi. Um, I'm Dave Carter. Among other things for the library, I select uh, comics and graphic novels for the library's collection. Um, I put together a, a research guide to comics and graphic novels. If you go to the main library website, which is lib.us.edu, and search on comics, this comes up. You can, you can find it there. Um, so uh, this main page is sort of an introduction uh, to stuff. There's a uh, feed over on the left-hand side of, of all the new, as we get the new comics in, they get added to the feed. And you can scroll down to the bottom, view feed, if you want to add that into your, into your own feed reader for that. Um, I put together some uh, web resources out there. Uh, we have uh, three uh, things that we've subscribed to um, that, that are behind, behind the paywall. You have to log in in order to get at them. Uh, two are the critical surveys of graphic novel. These are um, encyclopedic uh, works of, of, um, that, that cover uh, different things. So the one here on independent underground classics, for example, here's one on the entry on the adventures of Tintin uh, by Hergay. And so it starts out uh, talking about you know, the plot and some of the characters, uh, the artistic style, the themes in the work, the impact of the work, adaptations and other media, bibliography for, for learning more. Um, those are searchable or, or browsable, you can go through them. Uh, the other one that we have is, what's that? Uh, the Underground and Independent Comics, which is from Alexander Street Press, which is a, uh, it's a bunch of online, a bunch of online comics, mostly that are undergrounds, independent comics, uh, from the 70s through the through the 90s, there's not a lot of foreign language material in there. It's, it's mostly stuff that's either in English or it's been translating um, into English. Um, and then uh, some academic resources, you know, books uh, books on comics uh, that might be interesting uh, for learning for learning more. I started putting together some some theme pages. For example, uh, here's a, um, a 
for uh, comics with LGBTQ themes, um, list, listing of some uh, major works in that area, and then uh, what you can search on in Merlin if you're, if you're interested in, in, in finding out stuff more. Uh, which might be a good time for me just to hop on over to Merlin. And so, if, let's say you're teaching a course in Spanish or Japanese or something, and you want to you want to find uh, comics um, that that you could possibly use in your course that the library might have. Um, you can very simply do a subject search, put it in quotes here, comic books. Oops, not comics books. Still got stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, comic books. And then I can go over here on the left-hand side, and I see um, my, my uh, languages listed out there. Obviously, English is the most they have. Japanese, French, German, Spanish. So I can click on German. Um, see all the uh, German language comics that, that we have here. Um, Adolf is actually a, a Japanese manga, which has been translated into German, um, mm -hmm. which you don't see too much of, <laughs> at least in this, at least in this country. Um, so I, I can't read German, so I won't even try to read the, title, the titles of these things. Um, but if you, uh, and if there's anything that you're interested in that you want us to get for the library, by like, all means, let me know. I would much rather buy something that somebody's going to use in the class than just randomly pick stuff that I think somebody might want to use. Uh, my email address is superman at English. That is. Uh, should be easy enough for you to for you to remember. Uh, and let me know. And if you're if you're teaching a class on comics and, and you want someone to come into the library and talk to you can talk to your students a little bit about comics, I'm happy to do that. Um, I I also run or I convene rather a uh, graphic narrative discussion group which meets um, every other month. Um, we so February, April, June, whatever. We meet together for a couple hours and we all discuss a a, a graphic novel. Um, that we've read. Um, if, you, if you're interested in learning more about that, again, just email me, uh, Superman, if you wish that I do. And I should probably leave a little time for you to ask questions of, of Sabine, um, but if you want to follow up with me, um, I'll be hanging around a little bit af after here, um, or just shoot me an email. And thanks for the opportunity to come. I appreciate Thank you. it. So French 232 is fourth semester. Okay. So they had three semesters. If they went through our program, they did 101, 102, 231. So they only had three semesters of French mm -hmm. when they came into 232. Did they have, I mean, did you sort of guide them toward things that would be most likely comprehensible to them? Um, what do you mean? I mean, to some, I mean, the materials. I mean, I'm, you know, I teach Chinese, and I'm thinking if I pumped a bunch of Chinese comics, unless they were, you know, targeting like maybe younger kids or something, I think the students would really struggle. Well, that's what I was saying is that it's so visual that yeah. sometimes you don't really need to be able to read. Mm -hmm. And so even though the students might feel overwhelmed by all the quantity of language, mm -hmm. they can understand without reading. And so, and then, of course, you work into the language. And then we did a lot of activities about understanding the language so that you can understand the, the, the story better and you can get a better understanding of the culture and the references. But um, I don't think students felt overwhelmed. I had some very, very weak students in that class who at the beginning came to me and said, I'm not sure I can you know, keep up with what we're doing. And at the end of the semester, they were amazed at what they were able to say and understand. Mm -hmm. um, even though they stayed weak the entire semester, they really felt as if they were part of the class and everybody had something to share because of all the visuals. And, and as I said, there's lots of um, codes that are international. So even though you don't really understand the language, you can still understand a lot by the visuals. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Did you, was it five days a week? It was four days a week. And that actually worked better than the 274 because the 274, it's only a three credit class. So then they, we met only three hours a week. The four hours a week was much better, one hour every day. Um, and it was better also for their homework and for the, um, yeah. And so the, I think that students' level of confidence went really, really, really up at the end of the semester and some of them really felt un at une unease at the beginning of the semester. Thanks very much. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah. 
Um, how are you able to breathe? First of all, thank you. I love this presentation <laughs> and all the innovation and the ability for students to pick and really select what they want to work on. Mm -hmm. How are you able to rethink and translate this into assessment? So I, I was sure someone was going to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are many different ways to assess, and you don't really need to assess the content fully. And, and that's what I learned, and I forgot to say this. I think the best lesson that I got out of this is that it's OK for me not to control the whole content. <laughs> I've always felt, you know, awkward. I need to know what they're, you know, what they're learning. No, it was okay for me to actually not know everything and learn from them. I was actually learning in class from what they would find. And so in terms of the uh, assessing, then um, everybody read Asterix et Obelix, for example. And we talked about the authors, and we talked about the writer, and we talked about their collaboration, and we, uh, you sh I showed videos in class on how they work together. Um, so there were a lot of ways for me to test a common knowledge. And then we talked about the art. There's lots of things that I did in class where we analyzed art. Um, and when we looked at pictures and what do they want to say here and what do they want to say here, what do they use, what are the techniques, we learned a lot of vocabulary. And so then I had some in-class writings um, where um, I would say, um, you know, write a page on what you have learned about the author and the, um, the illustrator of Asterix et Obelix and how they came about the series. And then they were able to pull from everything that had been talked about for the last three weeks and then write about it using the vocabulary that had been given to class, using the grammar that we were using, the structures at the time, and using the, uh, the, the content, the references to the content. So, and then for example, uh, for the other one, for the um, Resistance one, then they, had, they were responsible for the story. And they had to, um, in the end, write also a paper saying, what did you, who was your favorite character and why? And so they had to pull from what everybody had uh, collaborated, and um, they had to learn that information as well. So there were different ways of assessing. They had grammar, they had vocabulary tests, they had grammar tests, they had, um, um, and then they were also evaluated on their oral proficiency because they were doing all these speaking presentations. Um, so just as a regular classroom, there really wasn't anything different in terms of the assessment. Yes? The collaborative um, reading that you talked about at the end, the, the part where they came together and pieced together the different stories, how was that a one class? No, uh, that took us a week and a half. So like six Because first of all, they had to get together with the people who read the same reading. So, for example, all those who read this one got together and created a chronology and then um, tried to figure out what their missing pieces were for them because not everybody understood 100% of the first uh, of that book. So then they together tried to figure out exactly what had happened in their book before putting them into groups. And then putting them into groups, there were several activities that I broke down into three different ones. Um, so I would say that the whole process, talking of, and then we talked about the author and the style. Um, so I would say we worked on this probably over two weeks. So it's not something that is being done in one day. There's, there's no way. It's way too complex. The, the no. piecing together part and how that was. No. And so the piecing together, we started, uh, I think it took us maybe, I would say, two hours, uh, two hours and a half to do the whole thing and then to imagine what would happen next and all that stuff. So it took a, a big piece, a big chunk of class. Yeah. Uh, have you ever thought about expanding this class or students making their own comments? So I've, uh, I've really wanted to do that. The problem is that there's not enough time. Okay. Every single semester, I've, but I've only taught this twice. Mm -hmm. And even last semester, I felt that um, I didn't do everything that I wanted to do. And um, I was really amazed by everything, all the ideas that came while I was teaching. And it feels like there's a lot more that we can do. And so if you want students to be writing comics, then you really want them to first understand how they are written. And it really takes a long time to look at um, you know, the art itself and then how to incorporate the text and the art. So we talked a lot about that and about the techniques. Um, but then students were really eager to read 
um, and I think they were more eager to read rather than to write. And I think that maybe writing would be the next step. So, um, and I think that in itself could take a whole course if you wanted to write comics. Yeah, it would be a cool sequence. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Yeah. yeah. But then it wouldn't be. I mean, it would have to be at a higher level, yeah. and not the requirement within the requirement. Um, even though a lot of my students said that they kept on reading comics afterwards, I don't think that even for those who would continue in French, maybe would want to um, do the next one. I don't know. I think it, it might work better at a 270 level or, or maybe 300 level. Is anyone using having their students create comics? No? Yeah? I have, yeah. And? Uh, it, it's. It can be powerful. You gotta set it up right. There are online tools that you can use, and there are advantages and disadvantages to those. And then uh, I've actually been happiest with people just doing their own drawings by hand. Uh, but it does. It takes a lot of time yeah. guiding them through uh, these things. What language but is this? German. Okay. Okay. And Jerome said the same thing. He teaches Hebrew, and he is uh, most impressed at, with the students who do the stick figures, even that, that drive them. Why? It's just less complicated, and the, the, the students, um, he thinks more per, more of their personality comes out in, in the, in the hand drawn ones. Because you, th you need to think about the storyline, and you need right. to think about the language, and there's really a or lot they'll, involved. They'll cut out magazine pictures of people, yeah. you know, and do collage. <laughs> the <laughs> easiest thing to do is if you're talking about a concept of how an artist does something, say, how could you reproduce that in another way? What's an, you want to achieve a, this mood? How would you do that? So that you don't have to do a whole elaborate comic, but just one drawing would be. Have you not had individual students who have already made a bunch of comics? So that was really the interesting part about my students is that um, <clears throat> in both sections, I only had two students each time who had read comics. They knew nothing about comics. And none who had drawn them. Nope. Wow. And so the students, um, so when I realized that the first time that I taught it, the second time when I taught the 232, we actually took a trip to the Vault of Midnight and we had a whole session there. It was so interesting and I had a sheet and they had to do stuff and we went to the store and they looked at everything that was there and we talked about comics and American comics, what are those? And a lot of students were just clueless. We, I had a couple who always knew more than what I did, and, and they were really comic geeks, but um, that was it. I, I, it was never... Um, that surprises me a lot. Well, that happened twice. <laughs> I only taught it twice, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I had a question about, so you mentioned this briefly about the theoretical aspect of how to read comics. So um, you said that you had them read some things online. I know, for example, Scott McCloud is a class. Yes. That you should read. I brought it here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess if I'm thinking about doing a course on comics, I want to know how long it took for you to set up the theoretical aspects of it. Um, well, the first time around, I wanted to do a lot more about mm -hmm. theory. And I think I did it for too long. Out of the, uh, I would say maybe three and a half months, maybe I did a month and a half okay. of theory because there's so much. And before they ever started reading? Before they, they ever, like, well, I showed them examples. Okay. Um, I showed them examples of one, you know, maybe one shots. And, okay. and so, so we, they did see a lot, but we were doing a lot of theory and a lot of history and a lot of comparing all the different genres and com comparing the comics mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Um, and then we got to reading, um, really having a book and reading it. And at the end of the semester, a lot of them said they wish they had read sooner. Okay. So I did it the other way around in 232. Okay. And we didn't start with a lot of, um, um, a lot of technique talk. We didn't talk a lot about the technique and the history mm -hmm. of the bande dessinée. And we went right into Asterix et Obelix. And they were so happy to have their book. Okay. I feel that students are really happy to have their book. Yeah. And I ordered them from, you know, from a, a website in France. And the day that I came with my books, they were like, ah! And they, they were all so happy to see it and to have it. And I think that made a big difference. Okay, and so then, theoretically, it's better to either do it with while they're reading 
So that's what we did. Okay. So then that's what I ended up doing is that as we were reading okay. Asterix and Obelix, then I did a lot of okay. putting in, but then I felt that it, that it dragged on a little too much mm. and that we spent a lot of time talking about Asterix and Obelix because of that. They didn't say anything. They didn't complain. Okay. To them, it wasn't a problem. So okay. maybe that's the way to go. To, for me, I felt that it was a little, oh, I'm sick of talking about Asterix and Obelix. <laughs> because, <laughs> because we had to put in some of the theory as we were reading. But okay. they didn't complain. Whereas okay. the other way around, they didn't like doing too much yeah. theory um, before actually having a whole story in their hands. Okay. And so, so, so you would suggest integrating? I would suggest okay. integrating and not waiting too long before actually having them read a book. Okay. And then they can always react, and then you can always go back. Okay. The entire semester we went back to Asterix and Obelix, and I brought it back to the class, and we showed different examples, and it helped their understanding. They, I think by the end of the semester they saw some things in Asterix and Obelix that they hadn't seen at first, mm -hmm. and I think that's okay. Um, I wanted to give them all the tools so that they would understand better, but I, I don't feel that's the way to go. Okay. They can learn as they go. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a question. I mean, you still have to answer it, but I keep going back to it. So one thing I wonder about, like as you're doing this, um, how does the teaching, the direct, explicit instruction of vocab and grammar come in? So let's say you're talking about your comic, and there are these verbs, and people they just encounter it on this page, and do you use it as an opportunity to talk to go over verb conjugations? So um, that's verb, exactly what yeah, I did. Have origins, so you do. Okay. So, so we, all of the um, requirements for the French 232, um, there were some language requirements, some grammar requirements. I did all of that, okay. and I incorporated into what I was doing and what I was finding in my comics. And how do you? Can you give us an example of how you would incorporate it? So, um, so we talked about the Second World War here. Yeah. So what I did is that I read the book and I looked at every single word that was there, every single verb that was there, and I created activities based on this vocabulary. I made vocabulary lists and they had to learn the, the vocabulary just like you would find in a book because we weren't using a textbook. Sure. So I created vocab lists and they had to learn the vocabulary, they had to come to class, they were responsible for this vocabulary, and then I created activities where they would use that vocabulary in class to talk about the characters. So I contextualized these activities based on what they were reading. Um, and then we also used the grammar. So for example, we um, learned how to use the subjunctive, and so I had them react about what they had read and I had created um, very targeted exercises where they had to use the subjunctive in order to be able to talk about the story. Um, so that was a lot of work, I would say. That was the bigger part of the work because for every single, every single reading, every single thing that I had them read online or in a book or I had to look at the vocabulary, uh, uh, look at the grammar that was used, help them with the grammar, help them with the vocabulary, and then make them accountable and do some in-class activities to reinforce the grammar and the vocabulary that they had found um, and find ways to assess that also. So that's why um, they were also tested on these. Tested on the vocabulary, tested on the grammar, but always linked to the content. And so that was, the, I would say, the bigger part of the preparation for this class. When they were doing your the personal, their, their own custom um, bon dessiné, did, did they also keep a vocab journal and a, a grammar journal at all while they were reading? While they were reading their own things? Yeah. No, not really. That's actually a good idea of mm -hmm. something to do. The only problem then is that how do you, how do you make them accountable? Because I, I had to give them a grade at a certain point, right, right. and so I had to make sure that everybody was also getting some type of similarity right, in terms yeah. of the vocabulary they were responsible for. Um, but so some of the so that w that was some of the challenges is that um, what do you do with the grammar and the vocabulary, and how do you how do you incorporate this into your class? And I was incorporating it on a daily basis, every single day. Um, and then they also learned vocabulary to talk about the comics, to talk about the art. 
they learned, um, you know, how to say, um, I don't even know the words in English, um, uh, you know, how you go from one image to the next, or all the movements, all the, um, the bubbles, all that stuff. They learned all this vocabulary, and that we did very early on so that they could talk about what they would see. So there was a lot of technical vocabulary, and they learned a lot of vocabulary uh, that was really just um, linked to comics. Not just what they were reading, but to comics in general, how to talk about comics. Um, and so we did a lot of in-class activities also based on that, using the grammar that they had um, learned. So what I did is that I used the, the syllabus from the regular 232 class. I looked at all the requirements in terms of grammar, and then I used all of that and I incorporated into the into the course. Just a logistic question. Were the students charged more for this class? How were you able to provide books for them? So, so the way that I did it is that they each paid for their book. And so they only had to buy two books that I ordered online. And the books uh, were about $20 each, which is not that big of a deal. Because that's the only thing that they had to, I mean, there was no course pack, there was no book, there was nothing. I provided everything. Um, so they bought two of those. And then they rented some online that, like I said, there were maybe one or two euros online. Or there were all these free ones that we looked at online as well. So I think maybe it cost them around $50 for the semester. Which is not $200 for a textbook. No, so I don't think, no one complained. Um, they were, and then when they got the second one, I was a little bit worried because it was a little more expensive. And they were like, oh no, fine. They were really happy to get the books, actually. I think I could have made them buy a third one. <laughs> but, but then how did they, what did they use for the grammar? They have a book for the grammar? No. Or I created everything. Created and that's where I'm saying that so that was the big part. I, I created everything. So there was no book, no course back, nothing. Yeah. Would you use those materials that you created to make a course back if you did it again? Um, I, well, see, that's an interesting question. Because this is, the content is changing so much mm -hmm. that. I would do that if I were to use exactly the same books. Now, do I want to redo exactly the same thing that I did with this one, knowing that the number four is going to come out and it's going to be available? I don't know, because that was part of the whole, you know, my goal was for them not to get the answers. And I knew there was a fourth that was going to come out and that would not come out in time for them to get the answers. So, um, so I don't know. If you want to make, uh, a course back, then it's really linked to the content. So it means that your content is going to be exactly the same. And um, I also want to be able to use the, 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 the website on the festival for Angoulême every single year changes. So every single year you're going to have different titles, different authors, different... So, th so the vocabulary is going to be different. The content is going to be different. The grammar might not be different, but since the grammar is linked to the content, are you going to really be able to... So, so I don't know if I would use a course back. I would use all of my material and adapt it every semester, but I don't, I don't know that it would be feasible. It, it, there might be a way, but... Um, I don't know. So that's not a very good answer, I guess. <laughs> you would want to be able to make a course back and then use this over some semester, over semester, but I think that's what makes it interesting. Yeah, you would, but you put up on your slide the, the instructor learned. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if a formal, um, I'm not sure the, the correct word, but having all the content and stuff planned out to the point where you can make a course pack, might that not reduce the opportunity for the instructor to learn? Yes, I think so. That's, that's why, and every, I mean, the two semesters that I taught were completely different, completely different. And what I learned was completely different from them because it's based on what they bring to class. So, yeah. But also, you're more connected with what's going on. More like, oh, I did this 
really yeah. feel stimulated. And like the website that I showed on the festivals, they change every year. The location changes, what they present changes. So, you know, it's also refreshing for the instructor to say, oh, what's happening this year and how is this different? But, um, well, I learned a lot, really. And as I said, I was not a comic geek at all. I didn't like comics. All of these, I was like, I'm not looking at this. This is not for me. And I really got into it. It is so rich and so powerful. Yeah. So even though the content is changing so rapidly, do you think there's still efficiencies having gone through this process? Oh, of day? course. Of course. And so I, I'm eager like to teach it again. Yes, yeah. yes, of course. Yeah, because and then you see what works well with the students and how they respond, and um, you can learn from what's going on in the classroom. Yes, yeah. So hopefully you'll try comics. And remember also there are funds for you to develop courses like this through LSNA and also um, through the Language Resource Center. We have funds for uh, graduate student assistance to help you perhaps research some of the do some of the work, material searching, um, help me draft things. So if you're interested in this, do uh, collection development as well. Yeah. And go to the library, really. I almost had a heart attack when I went up there and I said, oh, you had all of this and I didn't know. Um, there really is a huge collection and in a lot of different languages. So you should really go and have a look. Thank you. Thank you.